together. Um, do you have the slideshow for chapter 10? I do. Um, then I won't have to write everything on the board. You have a chance to kind of bring up the slides. Solar majors. Okay, about the same. So solar majors might think, ah, oh, this doesn't have anything to do with me. But how do you deliver DC to an AC grid? A little box, black box, all the <coughs> right? Magic box. Magic box. I'm gonna teach you what's inside the magic box. I know Phil says, don't look in there, right? Don't look in the magic box. But I'm gonna show you what's inside there. Because you're now at a point, uh, like I said, your education where you take an AC theory fundamentals of uh, electricity, you've done um, this class, and you're right at the point where we can give you a little boost to the next level, which you'll see from now until you graduate and beyond. <coughs> That's why I come in and do this lecture myself, either me or Austin, and eventually Walter will probably do this lecture. All right, so we'll start out with um, electricity, three-phase electricity. So this technology is to create uh, electricity, or what's called an electromotive force, an EMF, uh, are you know from the turn of the century, from 1800s really. Uh, but an electromotive force is driven by what three things? What do you need to create electricity? An AC power plant. You need a magnet. Plus minus. Well, you need a magnet with poles. You need Oil. Oils and wires, then you need something between those two. Movement, any kind of movement. So if I have a coil of wires, even just a flat wire sitting here, and this is a north south permanent magnet, I wave it across it. I literally just created an EMF. There'll be an electric potential for a split second as I push those electrons in the metal around with my magnetic wand. Right? That's basically what happens. 
So the easiest way to construct that EMF system is with a generator that has multi-pole pairs. So I'm gonna write a real kind of generic, it's not accurate, but it kind of gets the point across. Generator that has these coil windings in what's called the stator, the stationary part. And then you have north-south either permanent magnets, you can have several of them or one of them, and then rotation, and then you spin them. So this is looking at cutting through a profile of a generator. And now there's a couple nuances to this you'll learn later. One of them is that you want to keep the magnets as close to the coils as you can. So there's, I show like there's a lot of space here, but really there's very small uh, clearance between the magnetic rotor, which is the rotating part, and the stator. And what does it do? Well, there's a electro, uh, there's a magnetic field here. And remember, magnetic fields go through anything. Right? They go through the wood, they go through my body, they go through anything, the, the magnetic fields. And what's unique about this conductor is that it has a bunch of free electrons all lined up. So if I give it a little kick, a boost with the magnet, the magnetic field, it only can go one of two directions, right? And so what ends up happening is you'll get three phases out and there'll be AC sine waves. This is why we have AC sine waves in our grid system, because we're using spinning magnets, all right? But there's not just one, there's actually gonna be three of them, because they're in, the, in the cartoon version of a stator field I just drew, there are three coils in the stator. So as the magnet spins, it creates electricity, and if you graphed them all on the same line, they would have an offset to them. Does anybody know what the offset is? I'm not drawing it perfectly, but 120 degrees. 120 degrees offset from each other, right? That's because of the physical location of the stators, of the wires inside the stator, okay? The physical location is 120 degrees offset from each other, so as that magnet's spinning around, hits this one, then 120 degrees later hits this one, and 120 degrees later hits this one. That's why you get a max, a max, a max on the three fields, right? I'm not gonna dwell on this too long, but you get the point, right? <clears throat> so grid electricity, when we talk about grid electricity, three phase, it has a designation, L1, L2, L3. There's some basic um, uh, implied characteristics of L1, L2, L3, one of them we just talked about, that they are 120 degrees offset from each other. All right, so the, the implied characteristics are that they're all 120 degrees uh, phase shifted from each other, so that's V. We also know that they all should have the same voltage. Why should they have the same voltage? Because remember, when I create this thing, I have one voltage, and then what happens after the power plant there's this smokestack, and it creates electricity out of this generator, and it's three phases. I can draw three lines, or I can just put a single line and just a slash three. It's the same thing. Connect them together, slash three. And then it goes through what's called a transformer, right? The transformer box looks like this, where it has a certain amount of coil windings, either more or less coil windings on the other side. So now you stepped it up to a higher voltage. So this voltage is, could be uh, 700 volts or 1,000 volts, but I could step it up to 100,000 volts here through the transformer. And that's how we trans, transmit. I like to draw this to transmit. Because you do have to move it off the ground at higher voltages. And then that's the catenary shape of the, of, of the uh, lines, the high voltage lines. And then you step it back down at its end point. Now, what's interesting is all three of these phases were born together, they were created together, they were moved around. So if I step one up to uh, 100,000 volts, I stepped them all up to 100,000 volts, and they all travel. So as you're driving down the road, take a look, and you'll see there's always sets of threes. There could be three, there could be six, there could be nine. But when you're looking at the high voltage transmission lines, there's always sets of three, because they're, they're moved around together, right? And then, this could be still 100K here, and then we go through another transformer set, and we step it down to something a little more useful. So say 400 
volts AC. And we could step that down even further. We could step it down to, to multiple taps. So there could be 400, there could be 400 and 208. But the thing is, when you step them down, you step all three of them. Okay, so there's still three phases at these different taps. What kind of thing uh, uses a 400 volt three phase electricity? It's not the toaster in your house, right? What kind of things use 400 volts three phase? Motors. Motor, big motors, right? And where do you find big motors usually? Factories. Factories. So that's one of the biggest end uses for commercial buildings like this, for compressors, pumps, things like that. So one of the biggest uses is it ends up back in a big commercial building or a factory. So born here in a power plant, transformed, sent long distance, transformed back down to a lower voltage, and then used in to drive, you know, conveyor belts drive all kinds of stuff, pumps, compressors for the AC, so on and so forth. Why would I split something down to 208, three phase? Yeah, well, I did the wrong thing. Well, right here, I'm going to do it down below. But yeah, we're going to have, um, well, I'll just do this house up in the air. So we got a residential house, and residential house has the three phase 208, 120 degrees off, off uh, offset and what other characteristics? Uh, the you know rotation, um, so right hand rotation. I think standard in the grid, right? Because as the thing's spinning, it gets here, then here, then here, right? Instead of here, here, then here. What do I have to do on a three phase system to change the rotation direction? Swap any two phases. Any two phases, right? There's not two specific phases, but you convince yourself that if it's hitting A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and I swap every B for a C, then what do you get? Every B gets swapped with a C. A, C, B, which at first you don't see it. But if I chop this off, I see A, B, C, A, B, C, backwards, right? So you go from a phase rotation in this direction to a phase rotation in this direction. That's just a little kind of trick to, to prove that to yourself. Anyway, I just want to cover um, where it's born, some of the characteristics where L1, L2, and L3 are born at. Now, the we didn't talk about uh, the delta versus star, but long distance transmission doesn't need a neutral point, so it's usually delta. But when it lands here and then goes into the factory, it has, has a star component, right, or a Y component. And so there's a center tap neutral off of that Y component. I'll, I'll take it up this direction. So we have we still have L1, L2, L3, now transformed down to 208. If I take one of those phases, tap on one of those 208 phases and neutral, what do I get? 120 wall output. This is what most of you guys' experience has been up to this point, right? This is why we do residential wiring and then transfer into industrial wiring. Because industrial wiring is a different animal. Um, but that's how we get our wall out. It's just a smaller subset of the three-phase system. Okay? So factories have the 208s because you've got to plug your computers in. But they also have the 400. They might even have higher voltages than that. What are some of the common voltage on there that you see? Uh, higher than 400. No. 480, right? Yeah, 480. 480. I keep saying 400, and I mean 480. 400 is used in wind turbines. Uh, 480 is used in American factories. And then anything higher than that? 1,000? Yeah, cores. <clears throat> like medium voltage. Yeah, um, but then it's step back down again. Yeah, it is. It typically steps back down. To, okay. like, so 480 is probably the most useful driver. Um, What's interesting is how fast does this electricity move through this system? Nine times around the Earth a second, right? The speed of light. And so as this magnet's pushing here, in fact, there's a whole series of these generators in the grid, and they're all pushing at the same rotation at the same time, and they're all pushing these electrons through. And so this motor, when it picks it up, has that same frequency. And what is the frequency in the United States? That's 
That's the other thing that's implied with L1, L2, L3. It's fixed frequency. Okay. So to control this stuff from the early days, from 1900, you would have to use contactors, right? Big pieces of metal that would open or close and kind of steer like a train track the electricity in different directions, right? So you can have a reversing contactor. Um, time to draw one, but say a motor like this, and you had three phases. There's contactors there, and that feeds in feeds into a system that's L1, L2, L3. Now, how would I change the direction of this? I would have to swap two phases, right? So you have taps off of L1, but instead of feeding to this L1, it's now feeding to L2. You have taps off of L2, they're feeding to L1, and then this one can stay the same. And um, they have to go through an alternate con set of contactors, right? So this one would actually just land in the same position. So this is called what in contactor logic? Reversing contactor? Reversing contactor, exactly. I close this one, open this one, all of a sudden I get an opposite rotation. No big deal, right? But I had to do it all through big metal contacts. I'm going to show you something later with the VFDs where you don't have to do it through big metal contacts. Um, you can do a little more high tech, elegant way of controlling motor direction. All right. I think that's all I wanted to cover there. We did power plant, generator, transmission, the basics of just step up, step down. Um, now I'll go to rectifiers. Any questions? Yeah, this should be reviewed. Oh. past we've just used uh, a lot of contactors to kind of manipulate the L1, L2, L3. You know, the frequency was fixed, um, you know, the phase shift was fixed, the voltage, they all stepped up and stepped down together, the rotation you can adjust through those contacting, reversing contactor circuits. Um, now I'm going to divert and we'll get back to this subject here at VFDs, but I'm going to divert down to rectifiers and kind of build up an argument. So, what if I want to DC out of AC, whether it be the 120 wall outlet or 400 volts, uh, three phase? You'd have to use what's called a rectifying circuit, okay? And so the, the process of turning AC into DC is called rectification, okay? This should be in your, as a future electrician, this should be in your vocabulary now. You rectify AC into DC, okay? So there's a, picture of it here in chapter it's not 10. Chapter eight, nine. 9. 153 is the first one. And if you look at 153, I'll, show, I'll bring it up on the board so to draw it. rectifier circuit is taking a single phase AC input. You, you learned this in your AC class, right? What components uh, make up a rectifier circuit? What components are these? Diodes. Diodes, right, which are semiconductor devices that a very short version of, of explanation of a diode is they allow uh, one direction <coughs> to flow, but not the opposite direction, right? So they're one-way balance. In this configuration, this is not called a uh, Wheatstone bridge, I know you guys might learn that, but a Wheatstone bridge has resistors in this configuration. When you put diodes in this configuration, it's called a full wave bridge rectifier or bridge rectifier. Okay? And so I might ignore this two diode system, and they even show a one diode system because they're hardly ever used. If you look at the AC sine wave, you started out with something like this. That was, uh, you know, swung positive to a max, swung negative to the same uh, value but negative, right? So I had a peak and a negative peak voltages. If you send it through this full wave bridge rectifier, now it takes all the negative components and flips them positive, right? I will draw this. Actually, I encourage all you guys to bust out paper and, and practice drawing this stuff. 
because especially if you're wind majors, you're going to see it all again. And it'll be on your test. You'll have to draw all the stuff on your test. Um, all right, so I draw it like this with a diamond. The arrows should all be pointing to the right. So this is my really sloppy order. Something like that. Now you got a top, a bottom, a left, and a right. If you look at it, the input is AC is top and bottom. So a lot of times it's shown uh, L1 neutral, that kind of thing, or through some kind of transformer like you see on the left. You see an AC, AC input and a transformer, then you don't have to think about L1 and neutral. But what's your output look like? Your output looks like, now I could hop over this, or if I don't draw a dot, that means there's no connection, correct? <coughs> you guys learned that, that uh, convention. All right, so I get positive and negative rails. So as I'm scanning through some complex schematics, and I see this little diamond with the, with the rectifiers in the middle, and I get all excited because I recognize it, right? What does it do? It turns AC, single phase, into DC. Wall out of it into DC. What does this device look like? What's another name for this device? It's a better question. Bridge. This little wall bug, everybody see that little wall bug? This little wall bug here takes AC, single phase, neutral, and then it has a ground, although it's not the ground. And then what's the output? The output is probably a 24 volt, Input. I don't want to plug it this, this period. 9 volt DC input, right? So you got 120 degrees, 60 hertz, L1, and neutral, which is, I'll explain later, is roughly ground. Input, and then out of the box is DC, 9 volts. You get a positive and a negative, and the potential difference between those two is 9 volts, right? So what is that? Thing? Cell phone charger. It's a charger. But if I go to if I go to Radio Shack and I ask for one, besides a cell phone charger, I'm going to ask for a power supply. So this is the schematic form of a power supply. What else uses a power supply? Do computers run on AC like light bulbs do? No, actually, most light bulbs don't. Anymore. No, they run on DC, right? 12 volt DC. So there has to be a power supply. And if you ever notice, you can plug one side into the wall outlet, and there's the box. And then that plugs into your computer. By the time it gets to your computer, it's already 12 volts DC. So we had rectified. So the box is a rectifier circuit. It looks exactly like that it's in schematic form. The load resistor is whatever you're driving with that DC. So I can put this thing in, into a, a load resistor. Everybody know that um, your load, does everybody know what a load is in a load resistor? I asked somebody that they were in power generation and they got, they were irate out the parking lot because they got the question wrong. And it was basically because they didn't understand what load resistor is. Um, a load resistor, in the case of a power supply, is your computer, right? You can model that computer for the, for the purposes of modeling the power flow as of having a certain resistance. Regardless of what happens inside the computer, all the transistors, all the fans in there, just input, output, you can model it as a resistor. So that's the load. All right, what do we know about loads? What do we know about uh, sending current through a resistor? We know two different types of power, right? Power equals IV. That's theoretical power, I times B. We also know this other power, what is it? I squared R. And that's the power that if you send it through a resistor, it dissipates, it's the power lost or dissipated through a resistor, okay? Think of a toaster element. You guys all looked into a toaster while it's running and you see it's glowing orange. So what is it giving off as currents flowing through it? 